Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome. Welcome to uh, the second house lecture. The first one was delivered by the winner of the 2020 Lifetime Achievement Award, David Miller. And the second one today will be delivered by Veronica Angel. She is the winner of the ECPR's first Rising Star Award, an award made possible by our bonus fund created as part of the 50th anniversary celebrations. And it aims to recognize a remarkable PhD student or early career researcher considered to have star potential in the field of politics and international relations. To introduce her to you, I will simply read out the laudation that Thomas Saalfeld, the chair of the jury, wrote for her. And it goes like this. Dr. Veronica Angel produced an outstanding doctoral dissertation on the formation and life of coalition governments in Romania at the University of Bucharest, jointly supervised with the University of Bordeaux in 2018. In the two years since the award of her doctorate, she has already established a strong record of publications in international peer-reviewed academic journals and in highly visible edited books published with very reputed publishers. In these publications, she has quickly extended her areas of scholarly expertise and in output beyond topics covered in her doctoral work on coalition governments in Romania to include questions of East-West relations in the enlarged European Union. Having completed her doctoral work, she won several prestigious prizes and fellowships. This includes the University of Bucharest's prize for the best thesis presented in 2018, the Robert Elgi Editorial Fellowship of Government and Opposition, a postdoctoral research fellowship at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, an adjunct and research fellowship at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Bologna, a Fulbright Research Fellowship at Stanford University, and a Max Weber Fellowship at the European University Institute in Florence. Beyond her accomplishments as a scholar, she has been involved in high-level policy consultancy working, amongst, other, amongst others as a junior foreign affairs advisor to the presidential administration of Romania and a diplomatic advisor to the Romanian Senate. Moreover, she has contributed significantly to the refinement of innovative teaching methods during her stay at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. The jury found her to be a rising star because she has begun to produce research output of considerable quality and is simultaneously a well-rounded scholar with excellent academic networks engaging beyond the academy and contributing to the development of innovative teaching methods in political science. Veronica's current research focuses on the challenges to democratic state building and party politics in post-communist Europe. And that is also the topic of her lecture today. The title is How Low Can You Go? Declining Standards of Democracy in Central and Eastern Europe. Veronica, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. This is a great honor for me. Uh, before I uh, start the lecture, I want to take a minute here uh, to extend all my gratitude to the ECPR community at large for the infrastructure and the inspiration they have provided throughout the years. Uh, the ECPR allowed me to access great mentors and each ECPR experience gave access um, to colleagues and, and friends who acted as the ultimate support net through difficult years of self-doubt um, and an accelerated treatment of my own provincialism. So the friends have now become co-authors, their office mates, their critical reviewers, um, and we are still working on each other's self-doubt. But I hope all those who are active in our profession and who are listening now, in particularly early career scholars, are lucky enough to find not only knowledge in this close-knit community of ours, but also partners for life. Now, having the knowledge and the support network of the ECPR and other associations and institutions beyond uh, was very important as I, I tried to perform the great leap forward from being uh, 
just another romantic conversationalist hyped on hope with some abstract cause to make the politics of my country better uh, to becoming a more realist, uh, more grounded, more objective observer of European politics. And the challenges I face uh, methodologically or in terms of what content might matter for the uh, outside world, I believe make me more useful now. The truth is I had no idea less than six or seven years ago how deeply rooted are the challenges to the democratization process in the European Union's uh, new territories in the East. Um, I mean, in those countries that we commonly lump together in the category Central and Eastern Europe. I can see that more clearly now. And then that part of the future that we can see does not look great. Uh, the trend towards less democracy and anti-human rights manifestations is real in East Central Europe, but the quality and durability of democracy in the region is more contingent and conditional uh, than commonly assumed. So according to most index, indexes from the academic world or from, from units of analysis, such as the Economist Intelligence Unit, countries such as Hungary, Poland, Bulgaria, Croatia are, are weaker in their measurements of liberal democracy, while others have stagnated, such as uh, Slovenia, uh, Czechia, Slovakia. The Baltic countries usually fare the best, so that's why we never talk um, about them, except to congratulate um, um, Estonia for a gender balanced cabinet. Now, this is a conversation about democracy. Uh, but democracy is such a broad topic and the region of Central and Eastern Europe is not a unitary actor for which we can make sweeping remarks. So there will be plenty of loose ends and questions left unanswered by the time we end this. I will raise issues that I find important to pay attention to when we address the problems of this region and how uh, these affect European integration more widely. I will mostly focus on what we could do differently to better understand the complexity of systems in search of a new equilibrium. And in this case, the system discussed is in broad strokes that of a young democracy in a post-authoritarian setting. Um, I will follow a structure that I hope to uh, digress from as little as possible um, and answer questions such as what do elites want, what do citizens want and what the context demands of them to want. And to do this, I draw on publications which have informed the conversation on the path followed by post-communist EU members. And I'm sure you will recognize the references even if I do not explicitly name the authors. My thoughts are also mostly informed by my own research and, and field work um, in the area, which most notably builds on the Hungarian and the Romanian case. Now, in the year 2000, as, as frustration with delayed EU accession loomed in Central and Eastern European countries that were considered the front runners of the transition, Prime Minister Viktor Orban was quoted saying, there is also life outside the European Union. 20 years later, uh, Prime Minister Orban still says and acts that, like that. Although for his regime, there is no life outside the European Union. Mr. Orban and his political friends, as well as the people of Hungary, have benefited immensely from EU membership. Surely the distribution of benefits is greatly unequal between elites and the citizens. And this is a story that repeats itself in many post-communist member states, and it's certainly not uniquely Hungarian. The new mem EU members have had great political progress given their starting point as communist regimes. So under EU accession conditionality, we saw the rapid promotion of democracy and the development of capitalism and free markets and surveys constantly show that Central and Eastern European citizens value the basic model of liberal democracy to a degree similar to those uh, in traditional democracies. So a European Parliament survey made public a few months ago showed that when it comes to commitment to the rule of law as a basic principle um, of EU membership, the population of new members uh, do not show significantly, uh, does not show significantly different preferences from traditional democracies and other public attitude studies reveal that populations in the EU's eastern part are more satisfied with their standard of living. And most importantly, the physical and legal opening of these countries towards the West allowed many individuals to study, move and work in more functional and diverse societies. 
And this was an immediate effect that improved the lives of millions. I too am a happy immigrant uh, working as the, the famous lyric goes to get the job done. And if we stop thinking of the EU as a set of nation states, but as a mechanism that caters to the well-being of individuals, we can move away from feeling sorry for how EU accession wreaked demographic havoc in the population of Eastern Europe's towns and villages towards we actually never had any moral duty to remain and return to more accurate investigations of how individuals like us, like me, were positively affected by open borders. But this is a more controversial point that usually gets me into trouble, so I will not dwell on it unless you push me to in the, in the Q&A. Now I started with the positive side of the story, which is built on references to studies that bring evidence of happy migrants, increased freedoms and improved economic conditions, but we will not actually talk, talk that much about that. Um, because talking about the good stuff is not really my job. My job is to look under the hood and just like a mechanic to understand as best as possible how X may lead to damage Y, preferably before the advent of a crash. So however, I wanted to stress from the beginning that the story of these countries or more accurately, the story of the people holding the citizenships of these countries is by no means exclusively a story of failure and decline. The fact that these societies are doing well enough has also led to substantial complacency and an inflated perception of their actual commitment to democracy and human rights. And this is wrong. It was wrong to assume that a population and its governing elites who had no experience with democratic rule and with principles of social and economic liberalism could converge with the ideal of representative and accountable democracy in a matter of decades. Not even the self-perceived progressive elites of the 1990s made the fast leap forward, particularly as the center moved to the left. Their own light failed. They were in fact socially conservative economic neoliberals and who are now somehow, are now somehow surprised that their other anti-communist friends continued to be, well, socially conservative economic neoliberals. And it is now equally wrong to take this realization that societies are doing well enough, that they are stable enough and say, well, this is as good as it could have gotten. Eastern European citizens, whether they live in, Eastern, in the Eastern territory of the EU or have migrated West, do not live in the best of all possible worlds. And once more, the citizens of Eastern Europe, particularly those who still live in those countries have been left to fend for themselves with individual freedom slowly being pulled from under their feet. Anti-government protests at grave personal danger are now a constant and their light did not fail. Protesters and supporters of populist governments have reasons to be angry on both sides, but is blinding nationalism, xenophobia, isolationism, the default option for angry humans? There is no evidence to believe that. So let's get the rocky part of this conversation started. Let me start by saying that the title of this lecture is, is purp was purposefully misleading. I invited you to this talk with the question on whether standards of democracy are declining in Eastern Europe, ringing familiar bells that democracy is backsliding. Instead, my goal is to stress the fact that this may not be such a helpful question or at least present an alternative way of investigating the trajectory of these states. My research is not informed by the paradigm of democratic backsliding. Also, as I just mentioned, it would not be compatible with the line that we are dealing with a compact mass of starry-eyed citizens that are now disappointed by what liberal democracy has to offer. So why not backsliding? Well, democratization is a non-linear open process, pregnant with a high risk of reaching outcomes that are not necessarily subscribing to the liberal legal order of democratic regimes. This is why we have so many democracies with adjectives featured in the work of fellow political scientists, scientists. And these are in fact used to describe hybrid regimes. There is a rich literature on this topic from which we can learn so much. So um, I will not enter the debate on how helpful it is to understand democracy as a flexible concept. My own take is that democracy is very inflexible, so crystal clear 
in its ideal point that all the qualifiers we invent, electoral, illiberal, etc., were indeed necessary to explain the different outcomes of regime building. For the unfortunate reasons of the apparently sudden deterioration of the quality of democracy in the last years, researchers are increasingly required to go a step beyond these typologies and investigate these changes as authoritarian innovations instead, analyzed in context. Notice that by doing so, the accent is no longer on democracy, but on authoritarianism. And this could be more accurate. It is indeed a more helpful way to fight against the relativity we ourselves brought in in assessing the quality of democracies. However, it could still not be enough to uncover the complexity of the fragile equilibrium in young troubled democracies. Instead, the visual image I propose, instead of that of a linear deterioration, is of a bubble burst. Because the problems we are seeing are not in fact sudden shifts, but accumulations of problems unspotted or ignored, interrelated causal mechanisms, if you will. So borrowing from the language of economists, we are in fact seeing an instance of a democratic bubble to the East. Think about it in this way. For the economy, a bubble is a surge in asset prices that is driven by some exuberant market behavior. So during a bubble, assets typically trade at a price that greatly exceeds the assets uh, intrinsic value. The value, or in this context, the quality of democracy of Eastern European states and popular attitudes has been traded for many years at a value that does not align with its fundamentals. Indeed, European Union and its older member states may have been accomplices in this process from the early 1990s. The basic qualitative and quantitative demands that contribute to the well-being of a democracy have constantly not been achieved by the countries that are today's the East's troublemakers. In other words, what if all the bad news that is coming from Eastern Europe, including that information that does not even reach English reading eyes, is not just about what we have seen happening under the leadership of certain men, for they are men, but it's more of an accumulation of structural weaknesses that only create the conditions for these men to centralize power at particular time, bursting our bubble. Once we see the democratic crash brought about by inflated positive views of the real scattered and not to be taken for granted commitment of communist hating Eastern Europeans to liberal democracy, we can see plenty of similarities with the troubles identified by literature in Western Europe. And of course, we can see variation. But first we need to step away from the idea that Poland underwent an illiberal shift after 2015, or that Hungary had its singular shift after 2010, that Slovakia had its major challenge in 1994, uh, under Prime Minister Mechiar, or that Romania failed to shift in 2012. Instead, we could rummage through a world of problems accumulating at different times and in different degrees with different intensity, starting with the transition to democracy in the 1990s. And also we can see the opportunity for more pressure added that can deliver different types of regime change. So what did we miss there? How did we get here? Now, once we take the slightly longer stock of the transition, we will come across political and economic elites, as well as the population, which have continuously embraced or flirted with authoritarian policies. In particular, the concentration of political and economic power at the start of the transition was really bad, and that did not permit a separation of powers and boundaries between the state and the economy. And we are seeing the effects of that now. Poland and Hungary are presently the default example for things going wrong in this way through the accumulation of power in the hands of the very few. And we should not forget that they were also considered the front runners of the transition and, and had regimes that were supposed to be less monolithical than, than say Romania's. And on the contrary, Romania and Bulgaria, the underdogs of the transition are now surprisingly flying under the radar of criticism. However, the tarnished form of democracy practice in these countries is just a protective layer that covers all manners of ills. And if I may continue with the bubble metaphor, I borrowed from the economists, instead of complacency, a large market correction was more than necessary. Eastern European democracy should trade at a lesser value. 
Now, what should be closer to reality is that the problems these countries faced over the past 30 years changed over time. And each time the problem changed, the governments had to come up with a new solution to satisfy both electoral grievances, their own interests, and international pressures. And these solutions have often exposed the political elites uh, to the challenge of balancing their self-interest and leadership style with the rule of law. An investigation of how these countries navigated their process of EU enlargement reveals the difficulties of, of rising to standards, and yet they still had their ability to produce grand leaps forward overvalued. Enlargement was an active part of EU foreign policy, and it was absolutely a historic accomplishment. And yet we can trace in the documents of the European Union increasing acceptance of the enlargement without having all these countries meet the standards that the EU in its composition at the time had decided. And starting with the process initiated in Copenhagen in 1993 that built in greater safeguards to prevent countries from joining the European Union before they were ready, jumping through the years to the 1990-90 Helsinki process that announced a quicker and more inclusive enlargement and finally reaching the 2002 Copenhagen decision to even include Bulgaria and Romania, pending the toothless resolution of post-accession conditionality that is the cooperation and verification mechanism. This was not an objectively measured process from start to finish measured, I mean, by the same, um, by the same token. The objectives and the measurements changed in context and, and particularly in the context of the Yugoslav wars. But tracing it back helps us measure just how complicated it was to rise to the obligations of memberships as set out in the Copenhagen criteria. Such an investigation reveals flaws that were seen and, and ignored by the EU for different and quite rational reasons. So the surprise is not really warranted. But there were also things unseen, unfamiliar. And this brings me to the second point of the lecture. The things that we are not seeing, which we have not captured in mainstream political science research from the, the time we started to observe these countries transition to democracy. So I joined the, com the ongoing conversation about the quality of democracy by, by way of first understanding coalition politics. Two years ago, as, as Chris said, I was finishing a PhD on coalition formation and the role of coalition agreements on cabinet stability. And the case I had focused on Romania was intimately familiar to me. I was privileged to know the, the decision makers and at times even be in the room where it happened. This experience revealed to me that although the institutions that had been important in the 1990s did um, did, did structure elite, be, elite behavior and forced party members who were unwilling to give up some of their power to engage in collegial governing, there were still elite practices and shared rules that our conversations as institutionalists were not capturing. So for example, you may agree as future cabinet members to have a coalition agreement with detailed policy content and a fully developed literature that tells you that will produce X results in practice. Well, what came out of the tens of interviews I carried with ministers and privileged witnesses to party negotiation was that those formal arrangements mean very little if the political norm is that those written agreements don't actually matter, that they have a performative function for the public more than that, more than they are a blueprint for action. You know, similarly, the absorption into law of the formal acquis like communautaire does not equal implementation. As one Romanian foreign minister um, at the time of early negotiation told me more or less jokingly, and, and I quote, we promised to implement everything the EU asked for with very little negotiation. Diplomats were used to doing things this way. Romanian diplomacy up to 89 was used to working around issues. So it was constantly this feeling that there is another reality with decision making, within decision making that we are not capturing or that I wasn't reading about. And this brought my focus to informal institutions and the potential effects of those institutions that are not formally codified. 
Now, the problem with informal institutions for political scientists is that they cannot be captured in the same way you would account for that which is visible, not hidden. And we cannot apply a similar logic, certain patterns, certain predictability of behavior. We cannot account for that with, as easily. And yet informal institutions do come with hidden risks and we ignore them at, their, at our own peril. Um, and we have to get better at, at identifying them only by taking sort of deep dives and, and understanding the context in which people operate in the language of participants, we can also see what policies need to be applied to improve those humans' lives. And so you may have the, uh, the institutions in place that could incrementally structure behavior and enforce equitable governing mechanisms, but how can you have democracy without Democrats? Democracy requires a lot of self-restraint that is not necessarily codified in the laws or in how well countries integrated in their legislation, the European acquis communautaire. And such restraints are also informally codified. This is not to say that institutions don't work at all. On the contrary, they have had quite a transformative effect on elite behavior, not least because they force political parties to coalesce as a result of proportional voting, or since they apparently secured the possibility of turnover that would not allow the accumulation of power. But for that to happen, one must have the informal norm of accepting turnover. And that is also okay, and that it is also okay to, to lose elections some of the time. Now, this is a nod to uh, the Donald Trump situation and the current uh, US mess, uh, the students of which can learn a lot from the case of Eastern European governing elites that have real trouble accepting turnovers. The case of Hungary is the most acute one. Uh, the Orban and Fidesz elites changed the electoral law uh, in time for the 2014 elections so that fewer seats could be awarded to smaller and non-incumbent parties. And now as they head for re-election in 2022, uh, they aim to diminish further the chances of smaller parties to make gains by introducing requirements to receive votes in a certain number of constituencies. In Romania, the approach is, is even more cutthroat and, and less elegant. There, the, the horror of losing elections is so high at an individual level that according to studies, every fifth legislate, legislator has performed party switching with people changing parties to secure a new mandate even six or seven times in their careers. Mayors change parties before every local election by the hundreds to run on the lists of the party that scores highest in electoral preferences that respective year. So there are, these are some examples of practices or informal norms that have not been tracked in the indicators of the quality of democracy. So it is my view that these countries would look much worse in their earlier indexes if we were to go back in time and update them. Other examples of informal institutions are patronal politics and corruption. Now corruption is getting more attention and it has been increasingly signaled out as a potential break for democratization. Um, Eastern countries of Central and Eastern Europe are usually given as an example of this. So looking at corruption as an informal institution takes us beyond its usually analyzed role in diminished state capacity or poor governance or, or national security. Selective resource distribution can concentrate gains for a narrow range of groups while imposing substantial costs on the rest of the population. And this is the situation in Hungary and this accumulation of unequal distribution of funds can be traced uh, through public procurement um, allocation data um, or the overlap of political and economic roles as early as the 1990s. The same picture was also mapped by researchers for the case uh, of Poland using new technological tools such as network analysis. But it is still not enough to think of coercive strategies to root corruption out of high public office, particularly not when we have this understanding um, that the, of, of an informal institution that this is the way things work. At the level of bureaucracy and the population, an informal adherence to the norm of corruption. And this is not a uniquely Eastern European phenomenon. For the study of corruption, we learn a lot from research 
already done uh, on, on, on Italy, for example. And in Romania, beyond the arrest and conviction of notorious businessmen and ministers and former prime ministers, proximity to public office seems to be a, a coveted means for personal enrichment more largely. According to the annual reports from the National Anti-Corruption Agency, the number of ministers, parliamentarians, local representatives and directors of national companies who are sent to trial yearly under corruption charges um, are, are in the high tens. And we can infer from this widespread practice that being in government is not an absolute necessity to access resources, but proximity to state institutions is. Now we really need to see what went wrong and how the fabric of democracy was laid out in the 1990s to understand where problems also arise from now, to understand the web of interests that creates a regime and directs elite preferences be beyond say the, uh, the reign of an Orban. In countries such as Poland, Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria, basic tenements of EU membership and national constitutions, such as the separation of power and the independence of the judiciary and lawful allocation of state resources are formally guaranteed, but are also subverted through informal institutions such as corruption and clientelism. And knowing this is also helpful to figure out uh, the state of countries knocking at the EU's door with more or less conviction. And researchers of the Western Balkans highlight multiple legislative changes that do not get in fact implemented in aspiring EU members. So combine the concentration of political and economic interests with the resistance of informal institutions that cannot be sanctioned and the lack of desire to renounce power and what you get is a bomb waiting to explode. So, so far we talked about challenges coming from the elites or the supply side of anti-democratic policies. In this section, um, I will discuss about the demand side or underscored by authoritarian attitudes at the level of the population. Now, according to polls, overall intolerance is palpably greater in the East. Societies in Central and Eastern Europe are significantly less accepting of Muslims and Jews of sexual minority rights and legal abortion. Christian religion is a key component of national identity for many, and recent publications show that religious sentiment is also correlated with preference for far-right parties um, more in the East than the West, or actually in the East and not in the West. These citizens are also more likely to consider their culture superior, and this is a proxy for nationalism. And although liberal nationalism permits multi-layered commitments to collective identities and increased tolerance towards diversity, there is a difficult to grasp tipping point when a nationalism becomes incompatible with liberal democracy and starts flirting with authoritarianism. Now, people in these countries are also more inclined toward nativist attitudes. And I suppose this is the tipping point. Now, more than 80% of Romanians, Bulgarians, Hungarians, and Poles consider that being born in and having ancestors from their country um, as important components of national identity. So for the rest of the former socialist countries, the numbers dropped only slightly. At the other end of the spectrum, only 22% of Sweden, 36% of Danes hold similar views. Now, most recently, I came across the, uh, the Globsec Trend Survey, which is a regional think tank, who said that 78% uh, of people in the region agree that democracy, understood as a system based on equality, human rights, and fundamental freedoms and rule of law, is good for their country. However, 41% of respondents perceive democracy to be a threat when it is described as liberal. And this connects to social values. Imagine that this that's conservative to say the least population also had to balance their rejection of the liberal social model they were suddenly exposed to with their actual desire to get closer and closer to the West and reunite with Europe. So when whole municipalities in Poland declare themselves LGBTQ free zones, when women's reproductive rights are limited, when gender studies or conversations about genders are no longer allowed in universities in Hungary or Romania, who also have almost uh, 
uh, fully male cabinets, by the way, when signing the uh, Istanbul, <laughs> Istanbul Convention Against Discrimination and Violence Against Women is a contested issue in Bulgaria. And you see divisions in the society on who is pro and who is, who is against these issues uh, with the social conservatives taking the lead. We can conclude that different attitudes regarding further progress on human rights issues also remain a major divide between uh, the EU's East and West, regardless of, of the population's desire to reunite uh, with Western Europe. Now, women, the LGBTQ community and non-Christian religious denominations will continue to be targeted as second-rate citizens in these countries. Not to forget that the ever more numerous Roma population also lives on the margins of the society under the blind eyes of citizens and authorities. So when the supply side meets the demand side, despite years of substantive autocratization, such as in the case of Poland or Hungary, you know, stalled democratization, like in the case of, of Romania and Bulgaria, the flawed democracies of Eastern Europe could still retain a degree of popular legitimacy as they were able to address public demands for economic growth, physical and social security, and could generate diffuse support stemming from ideological social conservative claims. Enter COVID-19. Now, Central and Eastern European countries continue to be worse prepared to deal with any types of, of crisis uh, and than their Western European counterparts. Their healthcare systems are notoriously underfunded and, and there is a severe shortage of medical personnel. This winter's second lockdown hit Central and Eastern Europe hard, uh, but it has had a more diverse impact on, on, on global supply chains compared to the first wave. For this reason, and because uh, the new measures were less restrictive and large factories such as automakers no longer shut down, the impact on their economies is likely to be less pronounced. However, Eastern Europe's local currencies are highly sensitive to global factors and the dynamics in the Eurozone. So their economies are also dependent on those in Western Europe. And this makes them particularly vulnerable to disruptions in international production chain and exports. Ample government interventions together with central banks will continue to keep economies afloat but the transfer of EU funds to Central and Eastern Europe will be necessary to scale up public investment. And we can only hope the politics of austerity will not follow. This is not a unique Eastern European problem. All European countries need this agreement to increase the EU's own resource ceiling. You know, poor governance continues to dog public projects in, in Central and East and Southeast Europe, and we can continue to expect, expect implementation delays and cost overrun, even as funds are being released. But for the countries most dependent on EU funding, such as Hungary, weakened economic prospects represent a major threat uh, to nationalist Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Now, I mentioned before that as he prepares to face parliamentary elections in the first half of 2022, he is currently enhancing his, his election chances by modifying the electoral system to the disadvantage of his political opposition. One political science theory warns about a particular kind of policy mix that authoritarian or authoritarian inclined leaders use to maintain power. This combines uh, diffuse legitimation, repression, and, and co-optation. And when it comes to this particular semi-autocratic regime, it totally fits the bill. The longer the crisis, the greater the challenges faced by these rulers to successfully balance between legitimation, repression, and co-optation, and thus to maintain regime stability. But in the meantime, Orban does stand to win re-elections, um, as polls put Fidesz at 50% approval rating right now, and as funds continue to come to Hungary. So you see on the one hand, stopping the funding for Hungary could destabilize the regime, but it would have hurt the people in the process and halting funds would stop public investments and then obstruct their economic recovery to pre-pandemic levels. But on the other hand, continuing to provide funding to Hungary will likely reinforce the regime and allow time for these countries to find alternatives to EU connections. 
you know, as a whole, the smaller uh, Central and Eastern European countries do not have strong economic or political ties with non-Western states, such as China, India, or Russia. However, Chinese influence in the region has increased and Hungary and, and Serbia, country outside the borders of the EU have been the most active in developing more cordial relations with China in order to bolster their negotiation position with the EU. And now here comes the uncertainty. What outcomes do the citizens of these countries prefer? What triggers a population's support for nationalist, anti-human rights exclusionary policies at the cost of liberal democracy? These kinds of questions arise when you do not take nationalism as the default position for citizens. Many of us concentrate on the advent of COVID-19 to grasp the lenience of the public towards authoritarianism across the region. You see many countries across the world have implemented extraordinary measures to stop the spread of COVID-19. And most democracies have addressed the pandemic with no or only minor violations of democratic standards, according to Vida. Um, but in the flawed democracies of Eastern Europe, there are growing concerns that these extraordinary measures, many of which curtail individual rights and freedoms, may in the long run jeopardize civil liberties and constitutional democracy and work to further weaken liberal democracy. So how do Eastern European citizens react when faced with executives abusive power consolidation? I argue that the experience of COVID-19 and the related public fear that citizens experienced has acted as a trigger that decreased the relative importance individuals would attribute to liberal democratic procedures and instead heightened their acceptance of authoritarian policy measures. Now, I am now working in different teams to field survey experiments in the region to understand, uh, of course, first of all, to test this theory and to understand popular responses and to map elite-driven authoritarian policies as well at the level of the elite. In the meantime, we should expect the effects of COVID-19 to profoundly affect these regimes' ability to address popular demands. And should their economic performance no longer have been supported by EU financial solidarity mechanisms, national autocrats and underperforming nationalists might struggle to maintain regime stability. Perhaps you witnessed the fight for the rule of law mechanism play out between the European Commission and the governments led by Viktor Orban and Mateusz Moravci with Slovenian Prime Minister Janusz Jansa in a supporting role. Prime Minister Jansa is not doing very great right now um, at the helm of his government. And the European Union made this unconvincing push to connect the status of the rule of law uh, with the distribution of funding. Hungary and Poland strategically held uh, the EU next generation budget, uh, budget hostage uh, by posturing and not accepting the link the EU, uh, the, well, the, the link that the EU proposed between the rule of law mechanism to the distribution of EU funds. But the agreement was finally so watered down that we cannot really expect it to have an effect in real time. Now, the failed introduction of the rule of law mechanism, as well as EU's inability to use other mechanisms it already has at hand to constrain EU funds distribution is a result of EU leaders, Western European democracies and European People's Party in particular, prioritizing immediate political stability over European liberal values. And this is not a, an easy um, decision to make but it is one that will have cost in the long term. It's also not a surprising behavior because the EU merely refused to take measures to discontinue their ongoing accommodating stance towards authoritarian attitudes in its Eastern half. On the bright side, COVID-19 could still be an opportunity for the EU to solve some of its internal fragmentation. They will not cherish it fully, but the opportunity is there, as we have seen what blunt tools national sovereignty has to offer. Unquestionably, the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated trends of globalization, but I would argue it also showed the limits of nation states. The coronavirus pandemic revealed with celerity that individual choices and personal responsibilities are the main solutions to such global uh, threats for the time being. It also highlighted how communities are much more complex than their ascribed nationality, more dynamic and more interdependent. While experts and key workers are hailed as national assets, 
they are the first line of global citizens. Now, let me draw some conclusions and predict the future, which I love to do, although modestly, and although we are supposed to, uh, to say that we cannot. The governments in the region will continue to be among the least trusted and state capacities will remain among the lowest. For all those looking, the democratic bubble burst. Universal commitment to democracy was overvalued in Europe more widely, but in the East, this misjudgment overlaps with weak institutions and political elites who have trouble committing to the informal rule of also renouncing power. And we will continue to live under serious risks of amplification of authoritarian policies, whether in its degrees of gray cronism, such as in Croatia, Romania, or Bulgaria, or full state capture, such as in Hungary. Opposition parties continue to be divided and there is no significant organized oppositional wave. Even in, in Czechia, of which we have not spoken, actually two, two separate opposition alliances could form for the 2021 elections, splitting the opposition vote to the advantage of, of Babic and Anu. The European Union will continue to be under pressure to confront anti-human rights attitudes among the elite and the population and uphold minority rights and political pluralism. And the COVID-19 pandemic is teaching us a lot. It suspended the myth of the utility of at least the nation part of the nation state. Climate change, cross-continent migration and extremist ideologies are other issues that fundamentally ask for non-national driven responses. This collaterally affects, of course, countries of Central and Eastern Europe and the coronavirus pandemic shows we are not prepared with the right strategies. And yet paradoxically, such uncertainty provides fertile ground for simple answers from some elites, which is nationalism and isolationism. But these are not the default options. Not all European national politicians and most definitely not all Europeans believe national focus will solve such problems. The virus is giving fast forward lessons in dealing with globalization and contemporary cross-border challenges. We should be faster learners. Now, this was a lecture meant to be on Central and Eastern Europe and many of you may not have made it this far. And I understand not even from a theoretical perspective, these evolutions are not that exciting to watch if understood separately from the European and global trends. These countries are nevertheless the perfect laboratory of institutional and, and social change, and they should be on the agenda of any researcher who deals with this. But in the end, of course, it's just another experiment with regime building. And every country falls somewhere among the myriad of potential outcomes of regime building. What is more exciting and thinking of the longer term future for everyone is how these countries the citizens of these countries get to shape the rule of law culture and the values of a whole continent. Europe is small and has lost a lot of international clout, but it is still together with North America, the bearer of some sort of democratic standard of human rights. And in the upcoming ideological confrontation with alternative models such as China, and given how likely it is to see the US being led again by the current Republican Party, what this little continent chooses to prioritize will matter. So since this is the first Rising Star Lecture and I had no, no model to follow, but I do hope to set a, maybe a precedent of caring for the world we live in beyond our glorious ivory tower. So I want to wrap this up with a small tribute to the protesters in Eastern Europe, uh, to the women in Poland, to friends, uh, tear gassed in Romania for opposing the formalization of corruption and beyond the EU, to those freezing in uh, Belarusian and Russian jails, as well as to all the misfits who are nevertheless accused of dominating culture wars. Here is a poem from, poem from a Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, Stephen Dunn, and it's called Pagan Virtues. Pagan Virtues. If you have them, your day will overflow with options. You can re-examine everything that smells of dogma or the forbidden, 
Tip your hat to the great poem that is the body, maybe even uphold the beautiful by renouncing the pretty. Prepare to be in trouble on holidays, which are holy days for others, but for you are days off, a chance to exercise your pleasures, perhaps speculate why prayer never seems to reach its destination. Tell your church going friends that you're more like a justice of the peace than a witch or warlock, someone trying with the help of the best that's been written and said and without aid from the cloudy above to divine what's evil, investigate what's good, attempt to live in a world a person from another world might want to muck around in, raise children, guide them to discover for themselves what it means to be a citizen. Okay, Chris, you're still there. I am, uh, I am still there indeed. And I've been very quietly listening uh, to your impressive and very interesting, uh, interesting story. Um, time for questions. Um, I, have, I have two questions, one that came quite early while you were still speaking about COVID-19, but I will read it out to you. You can see whether you can, you can still build uh, a bit on that uh, argument. And, and immediately also give you a second one. So the first question comes from Theodore. It says, do you consider the COVID-19 situation and effect to the political and party system as a trauma? Second question, do you think that civil society in countries like Poland and Hungary that are systematically silenced by ruling parties may be able to mobilize sufficiently to actually present a challenge to the rule of law or democracy crisis. So one about, let's say COVID-19, you touched upon it, but it, is it a trauma? Is it a shock? Or is it something that, let's say, adds to, to what is already going on? That's how I would also translate the question. And the second is what, can civil society be, be one of the actors uh, helping to, um, to change things? So the, the um, uh, thank you, Theodore, for the question. So the answer is yes and yes. <laughs> it's the the, uh, the COVID um, uh, COVID situation is is definitely a trauma. Uh, but if we are to to measure its actual effects, it's more an amplification of things that were already there. So of course, it's a personal trauma. It's a trauma at the level of the communities. It's not different in Eastern Europe to other countries that we are studying. Um, but it does have an effect on, 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 on the processes that were already in place. And uh, it will polarize uh, the people who do think that there's rather a need to close borders, to isolate. Uh, it's the, the, the peril that comes from the outside that was already used by many of these elites to justify their centralization of power. And now they have a new, a new reason to, to, uh, to show that there is peril outside the borders. Um, and also it has actually led to uh, elites uh, centralizing power more directly. Um, the interesting thing, however, and we still have to test that, uh, is whether um, uh, COVID, and that is my intuition, um, has made people more acceptant of authoritarian uh, policies um, as well. So, so we have to test this um, um, exactly and see if there is a causal link directly there and still I mean, the, uh, the trials and, 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 and the situation is still ongoing. And we also have to separate a bit from the immediate trauma of COVID to see if the results are um, more long term or if they, uh, there was just an initial fear and then, then people will, will return to some sort of normal, whatever that is. The second question is whether they're mobilizing sufficiently. I do not think that at, at this point, the mobilization has created a tipping point that will confront these regimes. So if we're talking about the EU, of course, it's a different kind of protest um, than the protests in Belarus or Russia. Uh, where they can be uh, actually much more oppressed than they are in the in the countries of the EU, although the oppression has really been significant even even for in, in, in countries like like Hungary, although a little more sophisticated, or in countries like Romania, Bulgaria, 
and now we see it happening in Poland with the ban on, on abortion. But in neither places, I would say that right now in reading the literature that we have on protests, uh, are we uh, gathering enough information to think that these protests, these issue-based protests um, are uh, a sufficient condition for the um, change of regimes? All right, there's a question from Christian, but it only says, Dear Veronica. So if you want, if you really want a question, you might, uh, you, you might need to add a bit, um, a bit more. Um, I have one question from Eva that, it, that comes very close to what you already dealt with. I will read it out for you. Great presentation. I agree with that one. Uh, my name is Ivana. I'm, I'm originally from North Macedonia. As you probably know, we went through a civil uprising against the former government that was profoundly bottom up and pro-democracy. From your research, do you consider these events process, do you consider these events process can significantly impact the public's criteria for what democracy should, um, should be? Well, um, I would have to say that North Macedonia, I admit um, a, a major uh, problem here, North Macedonia has not been uh, on my on my list because I am looking mostly on the variation between the countries um, that are members uh, of the EU. Uh, so um, unfortunately, I cannot really help that much with the conditions in North Macedonia. Um, if I could lump them together with, and I know that they are lumped together um, uh, with Central and Eastern Europe, I would would say that the same kind of um, of analysis applies. Uh, but I need to know much more about the context, and I don't. And I think that context is very important, so I do not want to give answers that are based just on reading the news. All right. Christian has heard my message and has added. So first, this one. Dear Veronica, if you would advise new governments in the area, allegedly more progressive ones, what would you suggest in terms of addressing the supply side dimensions of the problem? In other words, how would you instill more democratic values in typically non-democratic thinking subjects? Right, so this is an excellent question. Uh, not the previous ones have not been, but this is an excellent question because it allows me to connect it to the, uh, uh, some uh, methodological um, um, adventures that I've been having lately, uh, which is that of understanding how networks work. So if anyone would listen to me um, in, in this situation, um, I would say that understanding exactly uh, how uh, social norms work and how uh, information travels within a network is very important because then you could use the influencers within a hub to transmit the messages that you want to transmit uh, in order to deliver change. So it's not just like, think about the vaccines. How do you uh, create the policy uh, for people to, or the policy or the momentum for people to get vaccinations? You have to understand who in a particular context. So again, we're coming back to the idea of context are the influences uh, that could set the model for an actual transformative situation. So in the case of, you know, how do we, uh, try to, um, to to present people with the um, with more let's say progressive values and and more uh, attention to the human rights. You would have to co-opt the influences of of this uh, of these networks. And in the countries of the East, they are not just the politicians, but you would have a major problem with the Orthodox Church. Uh, you would have to co-opt many of uh, some um, um, NGOs um, and, and also people who are actually more and more on social media, the young people, uh, the YouTubers for the young generation, and also whoever is an influencer and is thus um, in a position within the network uh, to deliver these messages. So officially I would say it's education, um, uh, but it's not just education that comes from the state and somehow you know, managing to change the policy in, in that way, uh, but also that which can be distributed um, in, in more, um, in, I would say more smarter, more methods and data-driven way. Okay, thanks. And there's one from, from David. Towards the start of your presentation, you made reference to how Americanists reacting to Trump's lack of loser's consent could learn a lot from looking at the CEE cases. Would you be prepared to expand on this point, perhaps? Does you envisage other democratic bubble bursts in the more settled democracies of 
Western Europe, because a number of let's say developments that you have been describing are not unique to uh, East Central Europe. Right, that's why I said this is a sort of, thank you for the question, it's a sort of a, of a laboratory. We can look at what happens in Eastern Europe, but what we find there does not necessarily, um, uh, it's not just, just about Eastern Europe, but it's about contexts where um, elites are, are just not willing to give up or share power, and there is no such understanding anymore of the uh, informal norm of sharing power. So one of the, the, the things that I would say that uh, the students of, uh, or like Americanism would learn, Americanists would learn from younger democracies um, is uh, a significant um, um, modesty and let's say separation from the exceptionalism uh, that they attribute to the uh, to the case of the US which makes them be very 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 self-referential um, and that is most definitely not a good way to uh, to make any type of, of analysis in in the long run uh, they would learn a lot from looking at how uh, power is accumulated, um, about how these informal networks uh, that overlap um, the interests of uh, politicians, but also economic elites um, and, and the media and so on, continue to aggrandize and accumulate power, uh, which they do consider that it's perhaps um, more, I don't know, normal. Um, and, and it's not, because if you accept that these countries are not doing well, by the same token, you should accept that the US is not doing that great either. They do have the institutions that they are very proud of and that they have functioned and that it's a, it's a great thing to have that Eastern Europe does not necessarily have. And it seems that Trump did not manage to co-opt the system to the extent that an Orban or a Kaczynski did in Poland. Um, but that doesn't mean that the next Trump or whatever, who is very likely to take power um, and after the next elections uh, would not be more, um, more successful at doing that. So they would definitely learn about the potential weaknesses in the system um, um, as well. Thank you. Then I have one from Dorota. In how far can the attack, and it's one on, on let's say European Union politics um, in a broader sense, in how far can the attack on the rule of law in Central Eastern Europe contribute to the so-called enlargement fatigue on the side of old EU countries and EU institutions? So unfortunately, I think that enlargement is over. Um, if you look at what's happening, uh, it's what's happening right now. I mean, the feeling of trouble, trouble that arise in the East, and it's not just that, but the trouble that the EU has uh, inside with, with their internal fragmentation um, will make them really, dis they will be, they are really dissuaded to, uh, to look at enlargement in, in the same way that they have looked at for these countries. Uh, so probably forms of enhanced cooperations will continue, uh, but, uh, and, and they have to be very persuasive, otherwise they will lose these countries. Uh, but I think that there is a clear loss of appetite towards enlargement. Um, and it's not, but, but it's not uh, strictly connected to um, uh, the adventures or the inno authoritarian innovations um, in Central and Eastern Europe, but to the problems and the structural problems of the EU more widely. Mm, thanks a lot. I'm keeping an eye on, on time. There are several more questions, but I think at, at this time, I'd like, I'd like to give the floor to David Miller. David, you, uh, you can come in. Ah, well, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Veronica, for a wonderful uh, synoptic lecture. I greatly enjoyed it. It was wonderful. One question I had was about your it was about democracy, but it was about a lot of other things too. And I wonder whether there is a danger when we look at East and Central Europe through the eyes of Western liberal democratic ideals that we place almost too many straws on the camel's back in the sense of expecting too much of democracy itself. So some of the issues that you touched upon like women's rights, issues about immigration, the road of the church. These, these seem to me to be quintessentially liberal issues that are not actually integral to democracy in the sense of the government of, of a country and the, the transfer of power, the party system, and so on and so forth. 
So I wonder whether when we look at Central and Eastern Europe, we should be careful to distinguish democratic shortcomings from other kinds of failings that we might see in those systems that are indeed liberal shortcomings, but not necessarily democratic ones. Thanks, David. Veronica. Thank you, David, and thank you for your lecture. I was hoping I would I would uh, challenge you on the uh, on the nationalism thing as well. <laughs> so I, I I really enjoyed your lecture, um, and um, so I do not believe. And here is where probably my bias and my my greatest weakness uh, in in analysis comes uh, through. I do not believe that there is a Western op variant of democracy and an Eastern variant of democracy. I just think that there is democracy and uh, that there is no uh, tailor-made um, sort of um, ideal that should be uh, accepted uh, for uh, the societies of Eastern Europe. And uh, so when, when we think of these questions, you are absolutely right to say that these are liberal issues and they're on uh, the agenda of, of, of liberals. Uh, but when I talk about democracy, I also include a lot the dimension of human rights. And from that perspective, women's rights are human rights and democracy includes human rights. Uh, and and in, in this way, um, I think that, okay, I've given, I mean, it was quite obvious that I am a liberal in, in thought in, on these issues, um, uh, but I do, um, I do think that uh, we have to, we, do, we cannot separate democracy from the ideal of human rights. So democracy is liberal democracy in, in, in the way I measure things, yes. Okay. One, one last, we still have a few minutes. A, a last one from, from Sylvia. Also something you, you touched upon, you might, you might develop the argument a bit, a bit further. What do you predict will be the impact of COVID-19 on the popularity and stability of populist governments and movements in Eastern Europe, specifically in relation to the rising protest, opposition against COVID-19 measures within the far right elector, electorate, sorry, and traditional basis for these governments and um, and parties. So you, you you did touch upon the way in which the crisis might might impact the capacity, uh, the economic impact. But what what would be What would be the impact on popularity and stability of the governments? So there was so the question I understand is separate. Thank you uh, a lot. So uh, COVID nineteen in relation to uh, to to protest and increasing far right uh, support for mm -hmm. the electorate and also COVID-19 for the populist governments, mm -hmm. which are not yeah. necessarily yeah. right. So uh, COVID-19 in relation to, um, uh, to, to the protests that support the far right electoral is, um, I think that the last time I checked these sort of things also for Western Europe, uh, there wasn't that, um, that of much of a major increase in the support of populist um, um, parties uh, throughout this period. Uh, so there we cannot really see, or at least at some point, and not just during the uh, rally behind the flag period when the governments were automatically supported, uh, but the far right parties that were not in government uh, did not do that great at the polls uh, for, for the first part. And now they are starting to change the for, uh, in Italy, uh, there is a particular party that is taking over uh, Lega voters, and it's, uh, for example. Um, but um, uh, the, the difference is rather on who was in the government during this um, uh, this crisis and who was outside the government, so outside of the spotlight. And um, uh, this thing, the, so so from this perspective, um, the performance of the governments mattered a lot. Uh, it wasn't just how the, they ideologically dealt with, with COVID, uh, or at least so far we do not see those effects being that relevant, uh, but, it, but it is the performance of governments that mattered. So in the case of a country like Hungary, which is perceived as having performed well, uh, the support for, um, for Fidesz did not change. Uh, for the time being. Um, it, it was more difficult in Romania uh, to see this because we in Romania they do have um, uh, for the first time a far-right party entering uh, the uh, the parliament uh, in the in the wake of COVID-19, but it is unclear right now, and I would not venture a speculation whether this is a result of COVID policies or if it's just a, a, a result of, or, it's, or if COVID amplified 
rather a preference for certain type of parties that was already there. Um, so we are still, I mean, it's very difficult to, uh, to give uh, straight answers right now. Uh, but as I said previously, um, uh, there is an intuition that uh, the way in which uh, uh, in which elites uh, rather dealt with the crisis um, is what uh, will uh, bring them higher or lower on the uh, in the preference um, um, in the preferences of the electorate, and not so much the type of of the crisis like that 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 is COVID. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks a lot. We have not reached the end of this uh, topic. We have not reached the bottom of, of the problems uh, here. But I think this is um, it's time to to close. Apologies to the few questions that were not uh, that were not answered. But um, we cannot uh, we could not take them uh, take them all. Thank you so much, uh, Veronica. You have um, you have shown us why you deserved this award of a rising star. I think your star has risen even um, even further. So thank you so much for this very inspiring um, lecture. Thank you to all of you who uh, were there, out there somewhere in the, in the crowd. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your questions. And keep an eye on your news feeds, on your emails. This was a second house lecture. This is only the beginning of a cycle that I hope will be a very, very long one. There's more, uh, there's more to come, but for now, this is it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. And uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone, for listening.